Okay, this is In Search of the Anima Mundi, part eight, Michaela Villiers Kendall. Midnight, the stars, and you. Um, and um, if you don't recognize that, that's actually, um, it's the song that plays in The Shining because I'm still in the labyrinth. <laughs> I am stuck in the labyrinth and looks like there's no way out, but I have to keep going. <laughs> um, I've got my thread, I think, I hope. <laughs> If I lose it, let me know. We're all losing it a bit, aren't we? Anyway, um, never mind. <laughs> Keeping it together. As they said on Washington t tonight on the uh, on the broadcast from the uh, Senate, was it? Um, anyway, the hearing. Anyway, um, the world's in deep shit. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I I'm feeling actually. I look exactly like Jack Torrance at the bar, don't I? <laughs> okay, I haven't been drinking. Right here we go. So. Um, so what we'll be doing, it, I mean, it gives it away, Midnight, the Stars and You, as I was saying, it's the song that plays when Jack Torrance, or The Shiny, if you've been following the, the, uh, the, the casts, um, is, is, is following the golden thread through the labyrinth using at the moment The Shiny, the film by uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, and it's, uh, the song is Midnight, the Stars and You, that plays when he's in the gold room in this wonderful scene, which I won't talk about now because it's in probably the next part if I get that far. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it goes Midnight, the Stars and You, and what it's actually about, I'll get to. Um, but one of the things it's about, I did get to uh, last time, was the constellations, which is the premise, excuse me, my hair, I had bad hair day, <laughs> like all of us, as I was just saying to Linda. Um, it's hopeless. Anyway, um, so I want to examine the constellations because what I got to last time was that uh, the constellations are behind the myths, behind the Bible stories. I did mention, and I'll just show you again, I did show you um, David Warner Matheson's book. It's very hard to see in this light, actually. I'll have to tell you what it is because I don't think you can see it. There, okay huge volume. I've got another volume as well. I've got three volumes. Uh, wonderful books, and they're based on Hamlet's Mill, which was the book that Kubrick um, based his, what they call in Hamlet's Mill, they call it a fugue. I think that's pronunciation. A fugue, which many films have done, um, but Kubrick hasn't been found out because he did it, did it so well and uh, so cleverly, is, is a story that's disguised, um, which in Hamlet's Mill, they say all the stories of the, most of the stories of the Bible, it's not that it's all literal, but most of it is not lit, uh, I mean, um, myth, m stories, um, and some of it literal, but most are stories based on the constellations, as are the myths. And obviously they go back thousands of years, and <laughs> rather than, and what Kubrick was trying to draw attention to, along, along with other filmmakers, artists, writers. In fact, Shakespeare used the fugue to great uh, advantage. And when you go back and look at his stories, you can see the constellations in them. It's amazing. Of course, Hamlet's Mill, the title, is, um, and I've got that book here. It's a hard read, actually. So David Math uh, Warner Matheson's books are wonderful because they explain it very clearly. But this is, it's wonderful, but it's, you have to, you have to really, really, it's you know, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, but it's very, very good. And that's what Stanley Kubrick used, um, got inspired by it. It was written in uh, 1969. So anyway, David Warner Matheson has, has mapped it out very clearly. And there's the other book that uh, Kubrick used, The Stars. He's put H.A. Ray on the boxes in the storeroom. Um, <laughs> he's even drawn attention to where he got it from. It's amazing. And um, that's because H.A. Ray actually drew the stars, the constellations, so you could see them better. You could see where the stories came from. He's joined up some of the stars that weren't joined up and made it much, much clearer. And that was back in the 1960s. So anyway, that's what it's based on. So I just wanted to go obviously more into that because I did use the tarot a couple of, uh, couple of casts back. And, um, and, and that was very good, but now, um, and 
when we learned it was the Kabbalah, I went into the Tree of Life before that. Well, now we find it's the constellation. So I've, I've now gone into the galaxy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so this doesn't look like I'm getting out any time soon. As if there's anyone left watching me, I'll just keep going because I've got to. <laughs> I'll write a book. Hey. Anyway, so um, I wanted to start looking at constellations uh, as shown in Shining, but first of all, um, the myths that, yeah, so obviously the Chimera is a myth, and I just thought, well, that must be in the constellations, because everything else is. Um, the Gnostic Gospels is certainly um, the Gnostic teachings, Hermetic teachings, which the Kabbalah is based on, the Tree of Life, etc. The alchemy is, um, is, uh, is, is, uses myth to a great extent. Um, so anyway, because it's, it's profoundly meaningful. It's not silly stories. It gives you much more, as we know as astrologers, because we're used to dealing with that. The layman isn't. So our minds go to that. It, they connect with myth and the, the, the hidden, hidden meaning. So it's perfect. So anyway, the art of the fugue, as I said, Hamlet's Mill, um, it's called that because Hamlet was a fugue. Fugue, I think that's pronunciation. Um, and what it is is a story disguised. Um, so it has layers of meaning. Um, Hamlet was based on the constellations as well. I won't say what at the moment. But um, uh, uh, so, yeah, that's the premise of it. Anyway, so I thought the chimera must be in there. Um, actually, I couldn't find David Matheson Warner. Uh, he had done um, the chimera in his. I didn't find it. He might have done, but I couldn't find it. So I did find another book, which I'll, I'll put on the screen later in the slide. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that the, 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 the David Matheson Warner is wonderful. He maps out the constellations. And I used the, the, the constellations I've put on the slides are the ones he's used in his books and his very good blogs. Anyway, so this is the Chimera. I put it up again because I did show another version of it. This is, I think, is a better one. Obviously, it's the, it is the Gnostic um, myth. Um, it's the, uh, it's the demiurge, famous demiurge of the Gnostic, um, of, of the Gnostic stories. So, um, obviously, you've got a lion head. Now, the lion head is a lioness, apparently. It's a lion's body. It's a lioness, but that's because the demiurge is androgynous. It's uh, it's neither male nor female, so it has a, a it's a lioness, but it seems to look like a, a lion. That's why. Okay, so um, then it has a head of a goat. It's obviously Capricorn, Leo, from our point of view, um, and then it's got the tail of a snake, a serpent, Scorpio, but then it could be the thirteenth sign. Um, so yeah, but basically let's call it Scorpio for now. They all have their, as we know, where Leo have, has their negative side and the demiurge is, is evil, basically. It's, it's evil, it's, it was a slip up by Sophia. I did mention it in the last one, so I won't go over again. But it was created by um, the great mother, Sophia. She, she brought this into being, although she is basically good. Like Eve, she made him, seems like a mistake, but was it really? And, you know, Anyway, so it shows there the, the lion is breathing fire, but in, in most of depictions, um, the goat is breathing fire, which is odd when you think about it, because why pick the goat? They've got a serpent, they've got a lion, but the goat breathes fire usually. Also, the wings are like a dragon. Uh, it could be a bat. I mean, that's why I thought when I saw it, chimera, the coronavirus is a chimera. That's what they actually call it. A makeup of different animals. It's like we've actually it's actually materialized. <laughs> and so it materialized right on the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, which is astounding. I did mention that, but I just have to mention it again. So there is, it does say about the Demiurge in, in the Gnostic teachings and um, in some of the yeah, uh, um, books about the Gnosticism that the Demiurge is, um, obviously it's evil and the, the they have the worst traits, I would say, of the Stein sign. So the Capricorn is about Saturn. It's ruled by Saturn. It's about control. It's about the patriarchy. I mean, not that you would call it, but it's the modern word, patriarchy. Um, 
and then of course and sat and eats his children so that's the bad side of the goat obviously you know this is a the bad side so we're not going to talk about <laughs> we're not being prejudiced about capricorns anyway so then the lion uh you know this pride this arrogance of the leo um and and the wanting to be the king uh, the ruler the ruler the the de the the, the God wants to be God. So the, the Demiurge wants to be God and thinks they are God and they do act like God. And unfortunately, we may have mistaken the Demiurge for God quite a long time. Anyway, um, so the snake, obviously the snake is deceptive. That's the bad side of Scorpio uh, or, or the 13th sign if you want to look at it that way. Um, but the snake is obviously on the caduceus as well. There are two snakes and one is the healing snake. So, but this is not the healing snake. This is the, this is the evil, poisonous, deceptive, lying viper. So anyway, uh, so right, I'll just say a few words that I just wanted to say these very good words if I've got time about um, <clears throat> the Gnostic, from the Gnostic, a book called The Gnostic Jung and the Seven Sermons of the Dead by Stephen A. Holler, which is a very good, he's very good on Jung. And uh, he just says, prior to an arising of Gnosis or individuation as Jung might call it, the human soul is dominated by many blind and foolish powers, projections and unconscious compulsions. These powers have been mythically expressed and given names such as Demiurge and Archons by the ancient Gnostics. Um, demiurge, fashioner, or architect, an inferior cre creator deity as distinguished from the highest god. Archon, a uh, ruler, a term for an inferior deity. Uh, it's like a, a, an angel gone bad. Oh, my hair. <laughs> I can't see myself. <laughs> you can't see me. That's probably good. Anyway, <laughs> while it is, an occasionally asserted, it is occasionally asserted that Jung's Gnostic statements, such as the ones contained in the Seven Sermons to the Dead, do not speak of a demiurge or archons, and therefore Jung could not be a Gnostic, it appears likely that such observations are based on an ability of some to appreciate the subtle code in which Jung's Gnosticism is articulated. It had to be, of course. One cannot help but feel that the observers making these statements simply were unable to perceive the powerful anal analogies and correspondences existing between Jung's concepts and the mythologies of Valent Valentinus, Basilides and their fellows. The primary demiurge in the Jungian system is, so it would seem, none other than the alienated human ego. This conscious selfhood having pulled itself away from the original wholeness of the unconscious has become a blind and foolish being, unaware of its roots in the unconscious, yet desperately attempting to recreate a semblance of the overworld by affecting unconscious projections, the ego thus appears very much like an inter intermediary between the realm of the extroverted action and the greater unconscious matrix, within which Jung saw all external phenomena to be rooted. Like the Gnostic et demiurge, the ego in its alienated blind arrogance boldly but falsely proclaims that there is no other god before it that it alone is the true determinant of existence and that the powers and potentialities of the unconscious are unreal or non-existent. The ego demiurge creates its own cosmos, but it is flawed and, it, and a distorted one. Inasmuch as in it, the light of the deeper selfhood is obscured and polluted by unconscious projections and compulsions. It is thus that the ego becomes a true demiurge, the foolish architect of its own foolish world. There's quite a lot here, so I won't say all of it. So I'll just finish on this bit. Um, the idea of the demiurge is not a, a mere weird and shocking invention of the Gnostics, by an but an archetypal image universally present in the human psych psyche and in inevitably manifest in the various myths of enlightenment or liberation. The unwillingness of some religious structures to take evil seriously and with it the image of the demiurge has led to the psychic impoverishment of the followers of these religions and it was i would say other structures obviously any new gnosis or gnosticism emerging in our contemporary world would of necessity have to address us, address itself to this important psychic fact and give it some useful and creative expression in present day terms It's sorely needed, isn't it? It seems like it's it's uh, absolutely needed now. 
Anyway, so about the Demiurge, it says it's a chimera-like vibration. We know that. Um, it said in the Nag, in, it says in the Nag Hamandi, the Gnostics describe Yaldabaoth as Ariel, another variation of the angel Ariel or Ariel. So um, bad counterpart. part. You'll know already if you've been watching the other um, casts or some of them that, or you know the Tree of Life, that uh, you have the angels and you have the um, archons and the archons um, inhabit the Klippoth, hell, in other words, the, the shadow tree as depicted in The Shining, which I've already gone over, so I won't, I won't go over again. Um, so anyway, Ariel means lion of God or hearth of God, um, but not in his image describes the Demiurge as a dragon-like lion, a beast, the counterpart, the evil counterpart of, of Ariel. So um, the beast is the chimera, a virus, <laughs> made manifest that infested our world to replicate itself through the human mind. I did say about the Wetiko last time um, uh, and in a cast about the Wetiko, which uh, Kubrick talks about also the Native American Hopi word, I think it's Hopi, um, for the evil mind, the, the shadow in fact, um, the demiurge that inhabits our minds and it seems like it's emerged. Uh, and, and we're watching now how it actually is exposing um, the, dem the, the demiurge, the, the wetiko um, in the world and in individuals. It's uh, stunning. <laughs> it's dreadful, of course, but stunning. Um, so it's a virus that manifests that invested our world to replicate itself through the human mind. It is the beast within, a persona, a mask of the demiurge, the phantom self. For those that are unknowingly possessed by the chimera, if they allow it to be an overriding force, that's if they allow it to be, but, but it comes on as aware if we are not careful and uh, if we are disposed that way also. Okay, so better move on. <laughs> oh, um, just say this bit about it. Um, once loose, uh, once loose, um, the demiurge can and does influence the illusionary word world for those that communicate with the, with the archons. Yes. Anyway, the archons is, you know, it's mythological, it's symbolical. Um, so according to the Gnostic te text, he is angry, she, he, demented imposter god that envies the human divine imagination and humanity's connection to the goddess Sophia. He is the beast, she, often depicted as the rampant lion whose minions become the inorganic archons that were supposedly birthed from the chaos caused by Sophia's fall through the pl pleroma, uh, the source of all that exists. Um, and John Lash writes in his book, um, and Sophia desired to cause the thing that had no innate spirit of its own to be formed into a likeness and rule over primal matter and over all the forces she had precipitated. So there appeared for the first time a ruler out of chaos, lion-like in appearance, androgynous, having an exaggerated sense of power within him and ignorant of whence he came to be. Right. So I'll press on, so I don't want to, to go too much on that, but I think you get the picture. Um, right, okay, go on to the next one. Right, so this is the um, Demiurge um, I discovered, as I say, from another book, um, and uh, this is uh, the constellation of Cetus, which is down there on the uh, right-hand corner. And there's a Andromeda, Pegasus, Perseus, Cassiopeia. Um, but it's the, the demiurge in this case is, is, is Cetus, which is the whale also. And as I said before, and as the Fug does, and as Kubrick says, and as the myths say, um, each constellation, they double up on their roles. So this is, in this case, it's the Demiurge in this story, um, and in another case, it's the whale, and I'm sure it's, it's it has other roles as well. But it's interesting because the way, it, it seems like the, the stories do overlap, they do connect with each other. Um, the roles seem to, to 
um, have a meaning in themselves that they share the same role. So there you have um, Perseus, who actually doubles up as Bellathon, who, yeah, okay, so it's, I better read it because I'll get the names wrong. Bellerophon, uh, who went to fight the Chimera, um, he borrowed, he was allowed, Zeus loaned him uh, Pegasus, which is up there. So um, he's Perseus, Perseus in this. So Bellerophon is Perseus, who, um, who borrowed Pegasus there to fight Cetus, who's the Chimera. Um, so the Perseid meteor shower represents darts Bellerophon throws at the Chimera. Uh, the red star Mira, which is in the Cetus, in Cetus, represents a chunk of lead, the chunk of lead, in fact, that was shoved into the mouth of the Chimera, the goat's head. Funnily enough, it had to be sho shoved into the goat's head. Uh, to kill it, and lead it makes you think of Saturn. It's like Saturn to kill Saturn, and it's heated up. So uh, what happens is because the goat breathes fire, that when um, when the chunk of lead is put in to, down its throat, uh, of course it melts, it goes molten, and and, and kills it. So there's an interesting uh, anal analogy there. Um, so anyway. So for about half the year, when Mira is dim, the lead is still solid. Um, Mira is a bright red star within Cetus. But then it melts at the block, at, and the block of lead turns red, killing the chimera. So <laughs> half the year, I suppose maybe in August, because that's when the Perseid meteor shower takes place, I think. Anyway, so that's it. That's, that's the myth in the constellation, uh, Andromeda, who is Andromeda in this? Uh, well, Andromeda is actually part of the horse in this. You can see the horse's legs in this, and that the square is, is Pegasus wings. Yeah, that, as I said, isn't out of uh, the star book. Um, so you can see these, yeah, so you can see they're, they're hard to judge. They're a little bit less, and if I, we show the next one, the next slide, um, you can see these are the same this is constellations, but they're actually a lot easier to recognize and understand as the figures. Um, because these are at, these are from Hamlet, um, from um, Hamlet's, from, sorry, no, Hamlet's mill, from the, the, uh, the stars, that book, the stars. The book that Kubrick read and also Cat Hamlet's mill read. And, yeah. So anyway, so this is the same constellation. Um, but this time, it's a different story. This is uh, the story of Balaam and his ass. And this is from the Bible. Um, it's not a well-known story. Yeah, that's it. So that's the illustration of it. So Balaam was in the, the time, actually, of the um, of, of when ba ba the lords of Baal, which I mentioned in, in the, sh it's mentioned in the Shining, well, <laughs> I mentioned in the Shining as, as uncovered. Um, the lords of Baal who sacrificed, who were sac who sacrificed their children, who made sacrifices to the god, the um, Molech, the bull god. And so he's in the time of Baal. So he's a lord, but he's, he's not Baal. So he's on his way to the lords of Baal, and um, he's going to make some sacrifices there. Not children, I believe, but, but bulls, probably, and rams. But anyway, sacrificing by that time was because it was the age of Aries was coming in. And yes, lambs could be sacrificed and rams, but bulls not so much because it wasn't Taurus anymore, the age of Taurus. And also um, children were frowned on. <laughs> God, God, God at least was getting some over in the demiurge and you know, saying this is not on. Anyway, so this is so this is the story of Balaam and the ass. And going back to the constellation, uh, constellations there. So in this case, Balaam is Perseus, um, and you can see there Perseus has a crushed has a foot. He has one foot turning in, which shows on this one. Um, and the story is that the donkey actually crushes his foot. Um, the story is. It's a bit complicated, so I'll just sort of try and put it in a nutshell. Um, Alan Boyd, Boyd Kuhn says about it, he's a, he's a very good writer on ancient myths and a Gnostic um, Hermeticism. Um, so he says, 
um, about Balaam. He says, we don't have to try to imagine an external, literal, historical figure named Balaam having a conversation with his donkey. The donkey actually speaks to Balaam. And of course, he speaks to him because donkey can see the angel and uh, Balaam can't. And he, he tries to warn Balaam because the, the angel has come to stop him going, stop him going to the sacrifice and tell him that if he goes, he will have to tell them he's not going to sacrifice anything unless it's a lamb in a ram, age of Aries. So anyway, so, um, so the angel's there, but the donkey sees him, Balaam doesn't see him, and the donkey won't move. He bars his way, and so Balaam hits him. He keeps hitting him. And the donkey then says to him, why are you hitting me? Because I'm your faithful servant. Those are his servants next to him as well. Um, and they're represented in the constellation as well by Pisces. Uh, OK. So OK, so Alan, um, Alan Boyd Kuhn says, um, we will not be able to figure out what it is trying to convey to us if the story if we try to force the text to be about a literal historical figure named Balaam. In fact, as we see, will see surely doing so risks inverting the esoteric message entirely. To understand what I think the story of Balaam is intended to convey, or at least part of what it is intended to convey, there is no doubt much more to this very deep metaphor, the depths of which each reader is invited to plumb on his own, his or her own, we must understand a specific part of the heavens which we have been examining in our analysis is very significant due to the sun's rising in the sign of Aries at the point of the spring equinox, going back to the um, constellations there, the map of the constellations. You can put me back to that slide. Um, yeah, so the sun's rising in the sign of Aries at the point of the spring equinox during so the age of Aries. So it's, it means the age of Aries has begun, and that's why he's not to go doing the sacrifices, because the processional age of Aries has arisen. And so um, there is the ram. Aries, the ram there. Um, the ram is about, burnt, as you can see, it says burnt offerings along with the bull. Um, the uh, Taurus, you've got down there Taurus. In this case, Taurus, uh, it's down in the left-hand corner. That's the ass because the horns um, sometimes, you know, they can they can stand for something else. And in this case, it's the ears of the donkey, um, not the, the the horns of the bull anymore. Now it's the ears of the donkey, uh, but you still got the ram. And then you've got the seven altars, the Pleiades, um, the seven stars, the seven sisters. Um, so they're the altars, the burnt offerings in the story. Um, his two servants, Pisces, as I said. Then you've got the, the great square of Pegasus, which is his Pegasus wings, is also the vineyard that the, the angel does. It says that the angel has, has stands in a vineyard. And that can also be a wall that is the wall of Troy as well. Those are the, it, it stands a lot in the constellations for a town because it's four walls, it's a square. And in this case, as you will see, it seems to come into the shining because it seems to stand for the maze, which is very, very clever. So this constellation actually makes it way, its way into the start shining. That's what I began with it, because it's it's one of the first. There are other, I will go into the other constellations um, for not today, <laughs> there won't be time, but the figure in the shining, because there are many as well. So what he's done is he's brought it into the shining and that is the maze. So anyway, um, so as the theme is sacrifice as well and about First born sacrifice and first born sons. There's a lot about that, but I don't think I have to say any more about it. Um, so I will press on. Right, I think, yeah, press on. Okay, I brought that into it because that's the alchemical dragon in this wonderful scroll. <sighs> Can't read my writing, but it's a very famous scroll. It's it's the alchemy there. You can see, and if you can't see very well, but there is the moon, there is the sun. Uh, above, so it is representing um, the mid heaven, um, the, um, the, count, uh, the, the sorry, the um, summer solstice, um, and uh, the moon below is Cancer, opposite. Um, sorry, the Cancer Cancer is represented above, as on the MC, but in the summer solstice below is is Capricorn, the midnight. Uh, the winter solstice. So there you have the dragon below. So the dragon is below there. It's below. 
it's the alchemical dragon. Again, you've got a dragon, which is, has, the tail is like a serpent, which sort of is reminiscent of the, um, you know, the serpent, the Ouroboros, Ouroboros, I need it. <laughs> Ouroboros, what, what's it called, you know? Anyway, <laughs> um, circling the, the um, circling the, the wheel. So anyway, so its belly has been split. So this is alchemical because the blood of the dragon the poisoned blood is alchemically healing. It's being released and uh, it, it will cause alchemy to happen as it, it's, it's along the lines of the Demiurge, which is evil. So evil released causes um, an alchemical process, which causes awakening consciousness and good to arise out of it. It, it, it makes the dying of one thing causes the birth of another. Anyway, we're pressing on. <clears throat> so the next uh, slide, catch up here. Okay, so this is the what I was saying about um, it's the wheel. Obviously, you recognise this, the zodiacal wheel. You know, you have Aries. The Aries point at the spring equinox, and then opposite the autumn equinox. Um, that's what's highlighted here because this is the rising, obviously. So this is important because it's showing. This is. Um, and it's showing above is represents heaven. So whenever you see the planets, the, the, the stars and constellations above and the signs above um, and the mid heaven and summer, that's heaven, the promised land, Greece, anything good, Israel. Um, and then if it's below the horizon, Troy, obviously, uh, that would be uh, hell. <laughs> so hell, Egypt, Troy, the bad guys, are in hell and they are below the horizon they're at the mid midnight uh, what is that? obviously above is noon and and you've got the winter solstice and naught degrees capricorn as opposed to naught degrees cancer so there you have the horizon which is naught degrees the natural zodiac and naught degrees aries opposed to naught degrees libra um so just to put that in because that is represented in that is the basis of every myth and bible story <laughs> And um, it is about the wheel. It's about the zodiac wheel, and it's about the uh, processional, the great wheel of procession. And that is the bigger picture of what it's all about, um, which is what Kubrick is saying. Yeah, so, okay, so that's what it's about. So we'll press on. So here we are back at, uh, just take a break. Yeah. Back in The Shining. And this is the scene where they're having the tour of the Colorado Lounge in, um, uh, yeah, closing, on closing day, it's called, near the start of the film. They've just arrived. And uh, there you have um, the manager of the hotel, and then there's Wendy. You can't see very well, but it's good enough, I guess. Then there's Jack, and then there's the summer. So Jack is the new winter caretaker. The new summer caretaker is behind him. Obviously, you have summer and winter there. So you have Jack representing winter, Capricorn. Uh, you have um, the summer caretaker who's, who he's taking over now because winter is coming in. It's about the, yeah, it's about the, 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 the leading to the solstice, the winter solstice. Um, so you have summer going, you have winter coming in, the wheel is turning. Um, but apart from that, this is the same constellation as Balaam. As I was saying, Balaam and the ass. So if we look at Balaam at the ass, again, the next, and we could, um, yes, flip back, if we can flip back to it, or do we, do we have it further? Hold on. I might have put it on again. I think I put it on again, didn't I? <laughs> uh, hold on, did I? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, back to the constellation. Yeah. That's, I think I put it on again. It's all right. I think I put it on again. After Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. Look. It's there. Okay, stop. Yeah. Okay, so sorry about that. I just got confused by that. Um, let's go forward. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yeah. So next one. And I got confused because I put Abraham and Isaac there in between. I got the, yeah. 
which is, I'll just say about that quickly, that is about sacrifice, as you can see also. I won't go into that because I haven't got time, but you can see also it's the same constellation. It's uh, Abraham is uh, Persis, um, the ram Aries is Isaac, his son, and it's also the ram. <laughs> so Isaac is the ram, in fact. He is substituted by the ram. Uh, the angel is Dromeda. Uh, the smoke from the fire that he's just about to sacrifice Isaac on, sacrifice. Uh, and in this case, um, obviously, the age of Aries has come in again, and he's not to sacrifice his son. He can... This, the angel has given him a, a ram instead to sacrifice. Do not sacrifice your son because the age of Taurus is gone and it's over. It's over, <laughs> as uh, Kipach would say. <laughs> um, smoke, Milky Way, that's from the fire, yeah. Okay, so quickly, that's that one. So we'll, 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 we'll go on to the next, I think it's the next slide, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Did I get my slides mixed up again? I don't know. But this is the Medusa. This is the book that I got the first constellation thing from for the, for the Chimera. Okay, a very good book. And that's also about the constellations and the myths and everything. Um, yeah, I've lost my slide now. Okay, sorry. I'm really sorry. I, I thought I was so well organized on this, but I got confused because of that constellation thing. Um, can we go back to the constellation very quickly? Yeah. Thanks, and, and and one more back. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong there. Okay, one more back, and one more back, and one more back. <laughs> one more. That's it. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the same thing, Balaam. But here you can see in that story you've got um, the two servants, a Wendy, a uh, Olman. And Wendy are the two servants in that lineup. Um, Balaam, Persis is Jack. Um, the angel Dromeda is the summer, uh, is the summer caretaker. Um, and you've even got the altars. He's got the altar on there. He's got um, a bench which goes for the altar. Um, and you'll see it when we flip back to it. And he's got, and the lamps actually, the lamps are seven of them, and the lamps and the wall lights. And actually, you could, when we go back to it, and you'll notice there's there's the also there's the maze, which is the vineyard. So that's the maze outside. So the, it's the, the labyrinth also. So if we go back now, you can see that. So the crushed foot. Remember the crushed foot there. Right, so now if we go back to the Colorado rim and the shining, right, it's because that, that threw me because I put, um, I put uh, Abraham and Isaac in the wrong place. Okay, so here we are, so that's what it actually is. You can't see very well, but between Jack and the summer caretaker, there's a cabinet. And at that cabinet, if you watch the movie, the American version, not the European, because you probably won't see the scene in the, in the European one, it's been cut. Um, you can see there's a man who, all the workers are there and he sh he's polishing the cabinet. He's wearing a red jacket. So <laughs> he's wearing the red jacket. In fact, he looks like Jack does later wearing his red jacket when he, he um, starts to be possessed, in fact. And so he is the went with, he is, standing in as, in as the winter caretaker to come. And the winter caretaker in this case is, is Balaam. It's complicated, but anyway. So Jack notices him, he looks at him. And if you can see that light above too is in the shape of horns, mostly it stands for horns, but in this case, it's the ass's ears. It's the donkey's ears. So he passes this winter caretaker wearing a red jacket and he looks back at him. And as he looks back, he then starts to limp, not for long, but he does a couple of limps, like he's got a crushed foot. Um, yeah, it's very clever. So he's he's showing you this this uh, he's drawing. He very cleverly um, will link all these constellations together in the story he's trying to show, which is all based basically to the Gnostic Gospels and to the um, to the Hermetics and the um, the Kabbalah and all of that. 
in the out in the outtakes. <clears throat> okay, so we'll press on from that. The next one. Oh, that that bowl on the table. That's the cup for the blood too. So it's really going in for this one as well. But it's not so much. He does ab actually depict a Abraham and excuse me Isaac later in the, in the movie, and I'll go over that when, it, when we do that. Anyway, so that's that book I told you about. Okay, so this, we're on the subject of the chimera and sacrifice. And with sacrifice, Kubrick brings in uh, cannibalism. He does it at the start of the movie when they're going up the mountain. He bases it on a real episode in history, but he has other another episode, I think, in mind. In fact, I think the episode he in, has in mind, he possibly has both of them. But because of the, the, the photograph at the end, and I'll give that away, in 1921, there was a, a terrible famine and it took place in Russia. And he brings 1921 into, into, that's why he's got 1921. That's the one thing I'll tell you about the end. That doesn't tell the whole story, but anyway. So 1921 was a Russia, a, a Russia, communist Russia, had a terrible, terrible famine. And people were actually so... Uh, it was because of the regime and people were starving so badly that they actually re resorted to cannibalism. This is 1921. And yeah, so it was terrible. I won't go into that, but I will go into the next big famine, which is based on this. Now, no, yeah, go back to that. So yeah, the next one. That shouldn't, <laughs> yeah, that shouldn't be there. But anyway, no, no, the next, no, back to the famine. The next, back to the Chinese, that's it. Um, sorry, Linda, I don't make your life easy to <laughs> It is complicated, but still. Um, okay, so that is the poster. Now that's Chinese, that's not from Russia. And I actually came across that because I was thinking about this chimera and I was thinking also, and I wasn't thinking it tied in, but everything seems to be tied in, um, synchronistic. Um, but I was thinking, well, how did, where did the, has this come about? Because I had heard there was a famine and I thought, and I did hear something about the wildlife markets being um, linked, but they started, where did this start? And I think I said on, on my Wetico um, cast that they did actually, um, they started in a famine, famine in China. Um, uh, but be, and before that, years before that, I think it was 500 years, they, they, there was another famine and they ate, that's when they ate, ate dogs and cats. So do, famines obviously aren't good news, but um, this, these, these two big ones were in, we've had others, but these were huge, huge millions died in these famines and they were under communist regimes. This one was in China, it was in 1958 lasted till 1962. It started with this um, Mao Zedong um, told people that he wanted to eradicate the four pests, he called them. And that's why there's a, there's a sword with these pests on them. Because people had to go and chase these things and kill them and they were, round, they were even rounding up sparrows, you know, trying to kill them. Anyway, it did cause an imbalance, but that wasn't what caused the famine. And that really, um, there had been drought, so, um, but there was no need to go overboard. And it says here, I have got a piece on it, um, the worst mass murder of all time. And it says a writer exposed the deaths of millions of Chinese people during the Great Leap Forward. It was called the Great Leap Forward. It says the Chinese Communist Party has released more and more documents detailing the budget and famine. But still most of the Chinese people don't even know. They, they think it was a natural uh, disaster, which I did. I remember as a little kid, I was told, you know, you were told to eat your food because there was children were starving in China, but no one really realized what that meant. And no one certainly ever thought that it was a, a man-made disaster, not a natural one. But anyway, tens of millions of people died during the Great Leap Forward. Uh, actually, um, it said up to 45 million people. 45 million people. Um, so, uh, Mao Zedong's pet project for four years when he thought he could divert rural Chinese farm workers into mass collectives. While most might assume that Adolf Hitler's Holocaust or Joseph Stalin's purges or the terror famine of Ukraine or perhaps even the slaughter of Native Americans in the New World were the worst mass killings in history, Mao 
seemingly outdid them all in an even shorter span of time. The Great Leap Forward killed as many as 45 million people. People, I haven't got time, so I won't go into detail, but it's worth looking up yourself. But people, then they resorted to, there were terrible, terrible things happening. And um, people were uh, killed horribly. They were punished horribly. Um, uh, it did cause a famine, but, but the, the, the really tragic thing was there was plenty of grain. Mao Zedong, for one reason or another, just stored it all and didn't let people have it. And that is true evil. I mean, that, that, so <laughs> the thing is, communism started with good intentions, but became evil like, well, fascism doesn't even have, didn't even have good intentions, and Nazism didn't either. But communism started with good intentions, and it, it basically became evil. Um, very quickly, which is part of the Wetico mind, which is interesting because this demiurge has come out of, of, of communist China. And the wildlife market started then. Oh, people were eating, uh, they, actually they, at the, the, they sacrificed, in other words, their own children. They would not, they didn't want to kill their own children, so they would give their children to some, to another family, so they could kill and eat their children, and they would eat their children. That's how evil it was. And this was only 61, started 61 years ago. Um, <laughs> now, and then people still don't basically know about it, nor do the Chinese. They don't know. Because they're lied to. And so this wildlife, market, that's when people started eating wildlife, because they ate anything they could. And so it started then. And then like these things, it became part of the culture, a tradition. And it's got to now where it's a billion dollar industry where rich people actually order these exotic animals as i said before and to eat now it's become seriously evil so this demiurge has materialized and it's materialized out of the virus the sars virus whether it's man-made or whether it's not i have my own views of that which i'm not political so i'm not talking about politics so i won't talk now about it but it's evil however it came about you can see it has a root in evil and also it has a root, as I said before, when, on the Whitaker cast, about people turning a blind eye. And this was what Kubrick was trying to say. But, and he must have been taking this into account as well, this famine in The Shining, because he talked about the Russian one, definitely. And so they were linked because they're both out of communism. Um, this has to go now. So I believe this is going to be the death knell of communism. And I think that because of well, The Shining thinks so too, Kubrick thinks so too, Gnosticism, and also the Aquarian Age. The Shining is about the Aquarian Age coming, basically. And it, it cannot come with that. It has to go. So this has materialized. And as Jung said, evil has to materialize before you can, you must recognize it. You must look at it. You cannot ignore it like it, it was ignored. And it's still being ignored in the world. And you can't do that because it will come out in the end and now it has engulfed the whole world. But it is still getting the world's attention. In fact, more than ever, it is getting the world's attention. And it is. And we have a lot of suffering to go through many parts of the world, much suffering. But consciousness will rise. It is the age of Aquarius and it is rising. Anyway, let's press on. That's that. Um, now. <laughs> I did put I did put this in the wrong way in place. So we'll we'll go on from that, but perhaps we can go back to this if we we go back if we get to that far. Okay, thanks, Linda. So this is the back of the shining. This is the forty nine states of mind, which is the forty nine keys on the typewriter. This is the crossover shot. Kubrick very cleverly did crossover shots to make his point, his concealed points in the film, his, his food, his concealed um, story many layers of them, many roles. And so this is the typewriter. This, this is crossovering over, over to the type where, where um, Jack is, type, is writing in the Colorado room. So this is when he's in bed. They just got here. Uh, it's October. It's nearly it's going on the way to November 1st, which is Samhain, which is important too, because that's, a, that's what the, the ancient Egyptian, and ancient Egypt, Egypt obviously comes into this too, because it's at the basis of everything. So the basis of the constellations, they were the ones who mapped them out. And it said that they, they mapped them out from an, uh, an even eight more ancient civilization that uh, was destroyed. But then that could be um, 
Atlantis or it could be called something. I don't know. But um, it, the, the basis of it is the ancient Egyptians mapped out the heavens and they knew all of this. How did they know about the procession? It's ridiculous. Obviously, very, very sophisticated and much, knew much more than we do. You know, and then we've, we've denigrated ancient cultures and, um, and civilizations and Gnosticism and, and, and indigenous peoples. Ugh, it's terrible. But Aquarius is here, so it's over. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so anyway, there you've got the typewriter with the 49 states of mind, which is from Gnosticism, which is, it, it's quickly, it's um, 40, 49 subconscious levels of the mind. Um, and it is uh, it, it very quickly about it. Um, Sam, Sam, Samael Unweo, who's a Gnostic scholar, says, there is hell, yes, there is evil, yes, there is karma. And he says, since the three-brained or three-centered biped, mistakenly called man, has not yet awakened consciousness, has not created the ex existential bodies of the being. He only possesses in reality subconscious and subjective states. Multiply the said triple aspect by itself and you will have the 49 subconscious regions of every humanoid. Obviously, on awakening consciousness, these 49 states become conscious and only then would we have conscious and integral objectivity. We need to transform the subconscious into conscious and this is only possible by disintegrating the psychic aggregates that make up the ego, the myself, the very self that has become dominant. This is a tipo, um, the shadow. Let us remember that consciousness is bottled up in such aggregates, disintegrating the latter. The consciousness becomes awakened. And that's basically the 49 subconscious levels that it go it does list them but i won't go into that now and also the axe so that's the cigarette packet and the and the pencils may forming um an axe and the axe um, symbolizes in ancient egypt it is a symbol of solar power which cleaves its way from west to east from horizon to horizon um and it's it's it's, it's Horus, who is the cleaver of, of the earth so Horus, um, he wields the axe, and the axe, uh, the, um, the axe represents the cleaver of the way. So the way from from west to east. Well, west to east is the procession of the equinoxes, isn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's what it means. But anyway, it's that's it's Horus and it's the axe. So very cleverly he's put those together there. So anyway, so the next one quickly. So this is um, in the reception. Wendy is uh, passing reception. That picture, that comes up quite a few times, in fact. Um, that position that picture is in, it's come up in the games room. It comes up in the dead twins. It comes up in... Uh, there's another time it comes up to everything but anyway um yeah it comes up in in room 237 anyway so that picture the leg in front of the other one um that is the star in the tarot it, it is the hebrew letter of um to zadi zad sadi my hebrew <laughs> pronunciation um I'm, I'm not jewish so i don't know so I'll, but anyway that's it, T-Z-A-D-D-I. And it represents Sophia, the Sophit, Pista Sophia. Um, uh, the star represents the water bearer. So it represents uh, Aquarius. You saw, I think in the star tarot, you also see um, the seven sisters, the stars in there. Um, and it, it represents faith, imagination, um, divine perception, the righteous one, um, and it is the rising of that. So we, we get quite a lot of that. Yeah. So it's 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 another sign of Aquarius on the way. It's it's another sign that the age of Aquarius is coming, and the age of Pisces is yeah is dying. So right, and there's there's the crown over there. A chandelier always means a crown in the picture, especially a lit chandelier. Right. Okay. And she's got the crown over here. So in other words, she she is she is also representing Sophia in there. 
she is representing the bearer of the age of Aquarius as she's taking on that role. She takes on many roles as, as do the other actors. Little do they know. Anyway, <laughs> um, there she is at the radio. Um, on the board, you've got fire. Uh, you've got police. I won't go into it all. Uh, you've got some pictures on there. The mountain, that's Kita. That's the top of the tree, the tree of life. There's also a picture you can hardly made up, make out above it. And I think that's wielding a, a club. So that could be, you know, that could be very relevant. I'll go into that next time, hopefully, if I can find out what that is. Then, um, but most importantly, uh, and also she's behind the reflections of the light behind her, the chandelier, make out seven Again, the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades. That's another um, recognition of the star Aquarius um, and Sophia. So anyway, so above the court board, which you can hardly see in that shot, but it's there, is the horseshoe. And that's very important because that comes up again. And the horseshoe has a very special meaning, uh, which if I get to it this time, I'll, uh, you know, if I get to the next, the end here, I'll, I'll say, okay, we'll quickly go on because I must be getting late here for the next one. Okay, so here are the dead twins again. Um, this is the last time he's, uh, Danny sees them. They are, as you see, they're in the side, they are in the, um, they're in the position of the swastika. They are also in the position of the, uh, uh, of Aquarius, but they are heading the other way, they are the other way. They're actually coming in, they're showing Aquarius coming in, although they're dead. <laughs> you see, there's a double meaning here. They are the twins. So they are representing a bygone age that's gone, that died. They're representing the death of the age of Gemini, which was back in the, so the Egyptians, that was their golden age, the, the age of Gemini. And when the age of Taurus came in, um, that was the end of their golden age. And um, so that's the dead twins. The age of Gemini, the golden age is dead. And that was the golden age of the ancient Egyptians, where they did, you know, they, they, but they built the pyramids, they wrote down all these ancient, um, this ancient wisdom that was preserved in the myths and in the stars. And, uh, and so, yeah, but that was their death, that represents their death. So it's not just the twins that are dead, it's the age of Gemini. So when the age of Gemini died, that is that chair, and I wondered what that chair meant, and that actually represents the chair and I won't go into Orion now because we haven't got time so I knew I wouldn't have time for that the next time the constellation of Orion obviously uh, you can see up there the reflection in the window and that's not hard to know what that is now that's uh, Orion's belt the reflection of the three stars um, and there so the chair is Orion's chair it's tipped over <laughs> Uh, the axe, there you know what the axe is already. Um, that's the cleaver of the way, it's cleaved it. The procession has happened, Taurus has come in and Gemini is dead. Um, interestingly, that picture that's tilted up there, I think that could be because this is about the great wheel and it's about the axis of the earth. And the thing about Gemini was it was, it's the, the, the perfect axis would be vertical. Um, it would be straight. But as we know, it's 23 degrees five. So it's tilted. So when that happened, we don't know exactly, but I mean, they say, the ancient Egyptians were saying that, and apparently they did say that it, it was in, they're not, the knowledge of when it happened was even handed down. But anyway, that picture is representing the tilted axis. So it means the imperfection and now Taurus has come in, so, and the blood, the sacrifice has come in then. And there you go, that's what it is. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a lot to that, but I don't think I have time. Okay, so he sees this, Danny sees the vision of it, and you know what that is. It's not hard, is it? That's the eye, that's the, uh, the eye of Horus. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. So anyway, at the age of Aquarius, it's, so it's saying that an age is dying. That age died, then that happened to the ancient Egyptians. The wonderful age went, that was this golden age, but it's saying, what it's saying in that, and it will say is another age is now dying, that's Pisces, another age is coming in, Aquarius. And the star, the, the twins are always also that they're in the shape of the star, which means 
it is a double meaning that Aquarius is coming in. The twins were on the run back then, but Aquarius is coming in and it is another golden age. Okay, so final one. So this is the crossover shot. Um, it's winter outside. On the TV, the film, The Summer of 42 is showing. So you've got winter, summer again. Uh, Wendy has been watching the TV. It's noon, so that's probably significant. When uh, Danny has just asked to go up to his room to get his fire engine. Um, he's just gone up and this is the crossover shot between him going up to his room and then that's him before he opens the door. You can see the door chain and the, the handle and the keyhole. And that has a, um, a meaning. I won't go into all of it now because I haven't got time, but... Oh, also the horseshoe. I just want to say one thing. I missed that horseshoe. You won't see it now, but look back on the slide of the dead twins and on the floor is a heel. It's a heel of a shoe. You can hardly see it. Oh yeah, there you go. It's right by the shoe. Yeah, that's it. So it's the heel of a shoe. And what is that doing there? Well, it seems to represent the horseshoe. The horseshoe that was on the board that if you look below on the board, and we won't go back to it now, but if you look on the board where the horseshoe is above, you've got a funny object pinned to the board that looks when you, when you know that it looks like a pyramid. So in other words, you've got the pyramid of Giza and you've got the horseshoe above, which is the rising sun. It's the Egyptian rising sun. It's, it's, it's pointed the other way, but if you turned it over, it would be the rising sun. Um, and that is, that is called, uh, well, it's, it's, it's represented in the, uh, the, 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 the scarab. Uh, it's the sun disk, it's the orb, it's associated with ke Kefri. Um, and also it's represent, it, it's, it's, it means the void as well, Bindu and the es esoteric inner sun. So yeah, so it's that. And it means that is, the, that is rising, the new sun is rising. Midday, Taurus was rising in that case, but also Aquarius is now. Okay, so um, back at that, yeah, that's the chain. The chain is uh, representing um, the the four. Yeah, it's the chain of the go back, <laughs> back, back, back. The four worlds, the four worlds of the Kabbalah, which I won't go into because I haven't got time. But it's the four worlds, and also it also represents. Um, so it's the chain of. It's called the chain of existence. And also it represents, um, and, um, it, it represents evolution. It represents an evolution, an evolution within a chain period. Uh, seven globes to a chain, there are seven links in the chain. Earth is currently in her fourth globe period. And I'll go into that next time, because I haven't got time next time. It's the descending chain of existence. But anyway, so, um, so I'll, I'll just, end with um, a quote with, uh, by, by Sam, Samuel, Samuel. And he says, this planet is at the precipice of passing through a great transformation. Um, as can be seen in the symbol of infinity, life and death are intertwined. He said this years ago. Um, For a new life to emerge and a new age to unfold, there must first be a death. This culture will die. That is not something to be afraid of. That process is normal and always happens. Our role in this process is up to us, whether we are caught in the flow of the waters as they descend into hell, or whether we swim against the current and rise up is in our hands. Okay, thank you, Michaela, fantastic. <laughs> Looking forward to part nine. Yes, I'm still there in the living room. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much for today and we'll catch you later. Lovely. Thanks, Linda. Bye.